Okay, so the price you pay for, for these kinds of things is that the switching will be, I mean, we are calling it slow, but it's slow compared to similar transistors. So, but if your interest is to do rectification, then for rectification, you know, you're looking at the sinusoid at say 50, 50 hertz. So I just have to be able to switch every 10 milliseconds. So that is considered slow, uh, but for applications like rectification, that's okay. Um, 10 milliseconds is okay, switching every 10 milliseconds. So I can switch on and off every 10 milliseconds. Then the unique thing about it is that it's a semi-controlled switch and semi-controlled in that basically when you can switch it on so you'll switch so you see we've got a symbol sort of like a diode um a diode with a gate a gate terminal so that we use a gate terminal to control it so one of the unique things is that you can switch it on it's current control so you give it a, a short pulse of current um so the manufacturer will tell you how long the pulse has to last and how big it has to be, the min, sort of the recommended size amplitude of the pulse, of a current pulse. So how much current should I use and for how long? But once you give it the pulse, then it will switch on. Um, that is assuming that basically it's forward biased. So, sort of like a diode, like I said, a diode which you can switch on and you can switch it on when you want. Um, and that has of course to be during the positive half cycle because it has to be forward biased. And then you can remove the current. Once you remove the current and the device will keep working. So it will work as long as you have a certain amount of current flowing. So, it's a really, it can be a really high power device. So if, so you will find this in like, um, for instance, when you're doing induction welding, induction welding, or just basically welding. So you remember with welding, you need quite a bit of current. And so, um, so you'd find this in all kinds of companies, people who make steel products, who do all kinds of things. When they need to weld, or even in for sort of modified versions when you're looking at a utility. So power utility can use something like this cause um, we've seen some, and we'll look at some specifications, something that will be able to block a kilovolt. So this is really, it can handle quite a bit of power. And so this is sort of, um, a diagram, sort of a way to think about that is structure. Again, you'll notice that it's a vertical structure. They always vertical structures. Then you have NP, NP. So it's a PN, PN device. There are four different layers. And then you have this layer in the middle is lightly doped. So you have the N minus. So this is silicon. So this is, uh, as we've said, you see it's thick, it's a relative thick area, and then also it's slightly doped. So remember we said those things, light doping and a thick area, and that is to help us be able to block large voltages. So you have those two bits. And so it's sort of for this one. Uh, these other ones are relatively highly doped. So then you have a cathode on one side. So there's a cathode and then the anode on this side. Um, this I picked from, so you see, this I picked from the Semicron application manual. I hope you've downloaded all these things. I hope you've downloaded them from the web because this is really free. So I decided to actually just pick something from the manual so it's figure 2.27, so you can look at it and sort of see what it looks like. And so, so for this one, um, so this is sort of the 
So I have one, two, three. So basically I've got three junctions. I've got three PN junctions. You've got that one, you've got that one, and then we've got that one. And as, as I say, it's high blocking PN junction. So at that point there's high blocking and at that point. So we'll be, so you can block positive and then you can block negatives also. So it's, uh, you can block positive voltages, you can block negative voltages. So, but the current can only flow in one direction. Otherwise, uh, if you have current flowing the other way, there's just a leakage current. So you've seen leakage currents in other devices we talked about. Okay, uh, so this sort of, again, this is also from, because that's where you can see. Um, let's see. So this is 227 and this is 228. So what I did is essentially just to add that jazz to show the junk, the different PN junctions and to number them. So I've got junction three, junction two and junction one. So then um, to really understand how this works, um, what people normally do is sort of split it this way. So under certain conditions, you can sort of split it. So most of the time you can split it and think of it as a combination of basically two BJTs. Um, the first one's an NPN BJT, then the next one's PNP BJT. So you can see what basically is done is to take the three and then put another split down there so that you have so it's four layers, but you can think of it as a device that works like this. Um, the controls at the gate, remember? So we'll, we'll be sort of basically, initially you're looking at something that looks like that. to get rid of a bunch, okay. Okay, but then I want to go. Okay, so um, initially, so we've got essentially these two BJTs. So this is PNP and that is NPN. So I'm going to shift, I'm going to shift to Paint, um, Microsoft Paint, and then so that way I can draw. Okay, oh, let's see. So with paint, I can draw, because I want to be able to draw this. It's easier to visualize if we look at something like point, like paint, sorry. So just a minute, let me shift. Um, let's see, let's paint. Okay. Um, there's a directory. Okay, oh, no, that's a diode. Okay, there it is. So we'll go to paint. Okay, so, okay there is some Microsoft Paint. Um, so another thing I'll do is I'll use different colors. So let's see if I can share this. Um, so where is it? So rather, okay, paint. Okay. So I hope you can all see this. So I'm I'm sharing my the paint, and then so we'll have two. So I'll use two different colors to sort of indicate um, the different things we are looking at. So. Get a hold of my tablet is a bit complicated, but it's okay. So, okay, so it's on. We'll use a brush. So, we've got two of these guys we've got uh, the NPN. Let's see, so I'll call that Q1. 
And I'll call the other one Q2. So Q1 is NPN, so Q1, NPN. Uh, and so it sort of looks, okay. We'll, we'll leave it the way it is. Uh, it have been better if it was the other way, but okay. So I've got a gate, which normally would be a base. So base, then the cathode would basically be our emitter. And then out here, this would, this would be our collector. Okay, so how does this work? So if I want to control it, so if we think about a BJT, we control it by giving it a base current. So a positive base current, IB. Um, remember what we've done is obviously we need to, I can put it out here. So this is your cathode. Uh, let's say we sort of ground that side to simplify things. Then the anode. Okay. So the anode, I can connect it to a resistor. So resistor and then sort of a voltage source on that side. So I give it a source. So that's a voltage source. And then I'm grounding. So basically I'm connecting them. And so, let's see. So I'll do it in such a way that, okay. I try to get everything to be. So because of this, so, let's see. I'm with this pen. I can't keep, uh, I need to figure out, okay, there it is. Okay, so I'm assuming this is forward biased. Huh? So I need to get this at least forward biased. Actually, in this case, as all these guys are forward biased. So if I have, so I need V anode to cathode, VAK needs to be greater than a particular Okay, I'll give it a bit of, let's just call it zero. This will be at, let's make it at least zero. So that, that will give a reason for basically current to flow from the anode to the cathode. So I need to make that positive. So afford bias that part. Um, and then again, remember we're looking at Q1. So IB is positive. So in that case, if the IB is, if I have a relatively large current, and again, doesn't have to be as large as it was in the BJT, then this device will be able to turn on. So my idea is to switch this on. So turn on, and then I'll have an emitter current flowing. And then emitter current means I also have uh, a collector current flowing. So I can give them letters one, just sort of distinguish it, distinguish them. So I can switch it on, give it a positive current, base current, then that should be able to switch it on. It's already forward bias. So VB is positive. That bit is positive. So then I start to get a current flowing, I see. So I've got a current flowing that way. So again, for simplicity, I'm assuming that the emitter current, so in this case, what I'm calling the emitter current. So uh, let's see. Okay, it doesn't matter actually, it doesn't matter. So, so this will start. So. First thing, where can I write that? So, so to start, so IG, which is equal to IB1 is greater than zero. Uh, obviously VAK is also Z greater than zero to keep things forward biased. So in that case, 
current starts to flow. So I start to get a collector current flowing. I see one. So as it flows, so then basically this really, the Q1 portion is within the active region. So I can assume that this is basically just in the active region. So I, I just have to use a small amount of current to get it started. So then it starts. So once it starts, then we can look at Q2. So we said we start with Q1 and then we'll go to Q2. So for Q2, what I'm going to do is to change the color. So, so that is obvious eh, that they're sort of, um, that we are looking at different steps. So red is the first step. Then what is happening is that, let's see. Look, keeping track of my, okay, there it is. Whew. So remember that now this collect, oh, it hasn't changed. Okay, it's changed now. So now I've got this collector current, I see one is actually equal because of the connection. It's really equal to IB2, right? So with, if I look at Q2, as far as Q2 is concerned, now all of a sudden I've got a current going that way. So I would call that IB2. And again, this, this bit is forward biased. And so since now we are looking at an NPN, so for NPN to switch it, sorry, no, it's not NPN, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'll just totally get rid of that. Okay, so actually what we have Q2 is PNP. So Q2 is a PNP. And so for PNP to start it, um, I need a base current too. That actually is going in the other direction, right? So it's a PNP. So the IB2 has to be going in that, that direction. And based on what we had before, Let's see, okay, so since I already have an IC1 going that way, it will have the same effect of essentially creating an IB2, meaning I'm applying actually a large current that is going in that direction. So I'm starting Q2 with actually a large current. So this will actually go relatively quickly into saturation. But okay, so if that starts, it means now I've got an emitter current, emitter current two, and basically I've got what would be equivalent to a collector current, IC2. So now it has started. So now this IC2, which again is going to be a large current, is connected to our initial base current. So I see two. So basically what I have now is I have two currents going into the base of Q1. So I've got IB and I've got IC2. So now I've got significantly more current going, flowing into this. The effect of that is to quickly push this into circulation. So remember that we had started with just a little bit of current that can just basically get us into the active region. But since now I'm looking at basically collector type currents, then this forces everything to go into circulation. So I hope that sort of makes sense. So we've sort of broken it down into two. So if I start transistor Q1, that in effect, starts, once it starts running, that in effect will start Q2. So that way I start to get this sort of positive feedback. So the loop, the current is feeding up, is sort of um, 
feeding back on itself positively, which means that it will just keep increasing. And so the whole system basically goes very quickly from active region to, okay, just a minute, from active region to saturation, which is what we want if we want it to start. Okay, Emilio. Okay, ladies, yes. uh, should, should we assume uh, true two is the reverse biased or I'm kind of like, uh, how come that the current I see IB2 is getting out of the, is going away, yet in order for us to bias it, I would expect it to be coming inside. So is that hey, the cold. reverse bias? Okay, I, I can answer that one real quickly. Yeah? So basically, remember that Q2 is a PNP DJT. So most of the time we talk about the NPNs, but this is PNP. So for PNP, then everything is almost, okay, not everything is reversed, but the current has to flow in that basically flow out of that device for it to start. So the difference is that's a PNP. So that's a good question. So you need to remember that most of the time we talk about NPNs. So we sort of, actually nobody really, very few people talk about the PNPs, uh, but that's the effect that you have a PNP. So uh, that's a good one. And make sure that you remember that we're dealing with a PNP. And so um, the advantage then, um, I mean, why would you do all this? So the benefit you're getting is that once this starts to run, so I've got positive feedback. So the current is feeding. So the device is basically running by itself. And what that means is that once it starts, then I can get rid of that guy. So once it starts running, I no longer need the IB. So basically what it's doing is latching. So that benefit of latching, so it latches on, it's latching on. And that's the benefit I'm getting, that it latches on and stays on which means that unlike the BJT that we saw before, so for the BJT to stay on, I have to have this IB or this get current has to be on all the time. But for this device, I can remove the get current, which means that with respect to time, um, if I look at my get current, then all I need is just a short pulse. So I don't need to maintain this current. So that's a cheaper thing to do. Eh? Just give it a certain amount of current, certain amplitude and for a certain amount of time. Then remove it and it will keep running. Uh, the downside as you've obviously noticed is once it starts running, it just keeps running. So which means that um, if I'm doing AC, it's okay that at some point, um, we have something called a holding current. Um, I'm talk, maybe I should talk about it later, but it has to have a certain amount of current flowing through it. Otherwise, if the current falls to a certain, below a certain value, it will switch off. But I can't use a gate terminal. Removing the gate terminal doesn't switch it off. So to switch it off most of the time, then you have to think in terms of how do you switch off a diode? If a diode is running, how do you switch it off? So maybe you can use a voltage source, make it go negative, all those kinds of things. So basically that's um, this the idea. And again, I'm going to switch. The problem is I've got, I want to get this done by today, by that. So, we're going to stop sharing this and then we'll go back to the slide. Um, okay, let's just go back to the slide. So where's the slide? Um, 
Okay, SCRI, SCRI, there's a slide. Okay, so I I'm back to, I'm back to the slide. Um, so we sort of know that if you give it a certain amount of get current, this thing's going to switch on. So what is happening? Uh, so we can sort of look back at this. Uh, this is forward biased, meaning that the anode is more positive than the cathode. So I've got this PN, so the PN is okay. Uh, the NP is a bit of a problem. Eh? So you can see that I've got two PNs, I've got that one and I've got that one. So those two, so junction three and junction one are forward biased. So as you can see, but junction two is NP. So this is reverse biased. So which means that essentially I've got to run enough current through this to break this down. So although it's reverse bias, I've got to sort of break it down. So if I break it down, so using that gate or any other means, then if this breaks down, then current will start to flow across it. So this junction two needs to break down. And so there are different ways it can break down. One way is using that gate. And of course we are applying a voltage across that. So that is the best way. And that's a recommended way to, to start this device. Um, so let's look at the IV characteristics. So, um, so I'll give it, so we've got two sections. We said we've got reverse. Okay, we didn't talk about reverse, but so the reverse side is sort of like a diode. So it's blocking negative voltages, but if the negative is too big, it will break down. Then sort of that difference comes when we look at the positive side. Uh, we said we can switch it on. So we can block positive voltages and then, so we can block negative and we can also block positive voltages up to a certain level. Um, generally we can block up to, so without a gate current, so I'm assuming you've got IG, you haven't given it a gate current to start. Uh, but if you try to block a voltage that is too big, so we run into, so we are looking at the black curve. So look, just look at the black curve. There's no gate current. So it's supposed to be off. So you're blocking a positive voltage. But if the voltage becomes too large, then it will switch on. So there's something called a forward breakover voltage. I'm calling it VFBO. That's with a gate current that is zero. So what will happen is essentially what you're doing again is you, you're breaking. Uh, you remember that junction two we talked about that gets reverse bias. So if the voltage is large enough, then that breaks. So junction two breaks down. So if that potential between cathode and anode is too big, this NP will break down because this is initially it's reverse biased. So if it breaks down, then current is going to start to flow. So then it will allow current to flow. So that is what is happening, that it's a positive voltage that you're breaking down. Then very quickly, again, I forgot to, to mark that down. So, very quickly, current will start to flow. So when current starts to flow, we remember what happens to these devices. The voltage across it, so will fall to a small level. So you'll have, when it's conducting, you have a very small, a relatively small voltage drop, and then you can have a large current flowing. So depending on what your voltage source is and what your resistor is or whatever the load, then it will latch on. So there's this thing called a latch current. It will latch on given a certain amount of current and then you can just keep increasing the current or doing whatever you want and it will run. Um, this is not the recommended way to, to run. So, this is generally called, considered false triggering. 
So that generally is not something you want to happen, but it means you have to be careful uh, when it comes to the kinds of voltages you're blocking. Then, like we said, um, okay, like I said a while ago, the other bit is that for it to stay on, that current within your system has to be higher than something called a holding current. So most of the time, this will be a few milli, milliamps. So you need to have at least a minimum, a few milliamps, positive milliamps running for this device to be on. So once that current falls below that value, it will switch off. And so obviously, if it goes negative, it will switch off like a diode that once you go into the negative half cycle of a diode, it will switch off. So, but with this one, this is a small value, but it's still positive. So, but definitely it means also when it goes negative, it will switch off. So that is how you switch it off. Make sure this current that's flowing through your circuit is less than the holding current. Um, the other bit is, uh, the other bit you need to know about these other currents so if I have these other currents, IG1 and IG2, they are greater than zero, but they are not enough to switch this device on. Means that with these currents, the effect is basically to lower the breakover, free, breakover voltage. So for blue, it's right there, for red, it's there. I didn't write it because I didn't have enough space. So VFB01 would be that voltage. So, um, so, I mean, so once you're coming into the exam, one of the things you need to be able to do is, if I was to ask you to draw the IV characteristic of an SCR, I want to see this much detail. So one of the issues I see is, so the way I grade this, eh? I'll give points for that, I'll give points for the zero, I'll give points for the VFBO, I'll give points for this get currents, that sort of this bit, I'll give points for having these three. IV has to be, so I need to see that V there. I need to see that I. So I need to see latching current. I need to see holding current. So I give points for all those. So what happens is every now and then, maybe I don't know if what happens. Okay, I want to be polite. People will maybe even forget to put that zero there or they won't bother talking about break this breakdown voltage. So any of these things, so, okay, the forward direction bit is not that important, forward and reverse, but these other ones have to be there. So I'll just count and say one, two, three, four, is the shape okay? Yes, VFB is there, all that. That's how you get full points. So don't just, write a few things and then think that you've sort of gotten all the points. So remember every one of these things you miss, you, you lose points. So that's sort of why you may walk out of an exam thinking you passed when yeah, the shape was okay, but you didn't tell me that was zero. Maybe you didn't bother to tell me that that's a voltage or that's a current, that kind of thing. So be, be, be really careful about that. And I mean, I'm, I'm saying that for all these devices we are going to, to look at, for the ones we've looked at. Um, okay, so we talked about this, this idea of false triggering. So SCR, how do you trigger it? The ideal case we want is to have a gate current. Um, it has to be above a certain threshold. So not every current will switch it on. So the manufacturer will tell you that I, I want to get current of this amplitude and it has to last a certain amount of time to switch this on. Again, I'm assuming that it's forward biased. So the anode is at a higher potential than the cathode. So like a diode, it really has to be forward biased. So then there are these other cases. So we said, it can trigger falsely, so we can have false triggering or accidental triggering if the VAK is greater than the VFBO. 
So with IG is equal to zero. So if you're trying to block a very large voltage and junction two breaks down, it will conduct. Um, if it gets too hot, again, mainly this junction two business, it will break down and you, it will start. So we're looking at disadvantages of this device. Then if the current is changing too quickly, so again, a manufacturer will tell you that, sorry, will tell you that make sure the voltage you're applying to this doesn't change too quickly. And so if it changes too quickly, then you sort of have this condition eh, that a first change of uh, voltage, so DVDT with a capacitance really looks like a current. So remember that, and I haven't talked about it, but every time you have that PN junction, you have that depletion region, right? And so this device, the PN junction sort of at relatively high frequencies, it starts to look like um, a capacitor. So the PN junction, so you have the P has a whole bunch of free holes. Then the N has a whole bunch of electrons. So those things are good conductors. Then in the middle of that good conductor, you have the depletion region. So the depletion region is kind of like an insulator. So every time we have two, an insulator between two good conductors, that looks like a capacitance. A capac it is a capacitor sort of. So you have current flowing. So if this changes very quickly, then it's almost as if you are playing a gate current. So that you get that force triggering. So what does that mean? It means you have to be very careful in terms of your cooling, that voltage you're blocking. Remember, this can sort of happen with things that sort of look like more like surges or something like that. Then you also need to make sure that this doesn't change very quickly. Again, remember most of the time we assume that we're just dealing with the load is just some kind of resistor. But remember the load could be something else. You could have an inductance, you could have a capacitance in there. So you could have something that changes your voltage. You could have some sort of, something that sort of forces a step in the voltage. So that will switch it on. So um, it means you need to f have protection against false triggering. That's a disadvantage. So this is a high changing voltage, which means you need some kind of filtering mechanism. So you pray connect a pyro circuit, pyro to your ACR, so that anything that sort of changes very quickly gets filtered out. So they call it snubby. So you need some kind of snubber to make sure this doesn't happen. So that complication uh, is a price you pay for using the SCR. The benefits we said is this thing can block a kilovolt. So if, I'm, if I've got a machine that is welding, so you've seen those welding machines in, well, I don't know if you've seen them or not, but you have large welding machines in industry. So then they need large amounts of current and large, be able to block large voltages. So SCR is good for that, but uh, this is a disadvantage. You need that extra circuitry to make sure it doesn't switch on accidentally. So plus of course it's a current driven device. So that's also, that adds to the complication. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So, like I said, with, with all these things, you sort of have to give up something um, that, I mean, if you want something that's handling a lot of power, then the circuitry around it is, has to become more complicated, unfortunately. So that's why you can't use an SCR, for instance, yeah, if, you just, if you just want a simple rectifier for your charger, for your phone charger, because you'll have to have all this other extra circuitry. 
And the control bit is more complicated because eh? you have that control. So if all you want to do is to charge your battery, then you get a simple rectifier, just a bunch of diodes that will do it. Normally two diodes will do it as we'll see later on. So um, for, for the SCR, I said this is the most basic sort of approach. So I've got a source voltage, a sinusoid. So coming, so maybe I've got AC power from the utility, Umeme, for instance. So this is coming in at 50 Hertz. Then it will allow current to flow in, in only one direction. So the positive half cycle, and this will only flow if I give it a sufficient get current. Right? So, so I have to trigger it on. So it will block every negative voltage, but even for the forward voltages, unless I trigger it, it won't switch on. <coughs> so that's the difference between this and the normal diode, that during a positive half cycle, I still have to trigger it so that it goes from off to on. And so that's something people sometimes forget. So well, what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to switch to a simulation. So since we have just a few minutes left, so I'm going to switch to a simulation so that you see what this looks like. Um, it's important enough. Um, again, I like LT Spice. Um, so we're going to look at something from LT Spice. Let's see. Where's my LT Spice? Okay, straight there. Um, rectification. Uh, what did I call it? So SCR example two. Okay, uh, let's share. Let's share this. So we'll share this LT Spice. The other simulation things do this too, um, but <coughs> I like LT Spice. So this is a rectifier circuit we had before. Uh, sorry. So um, I've got an AC source. Uh, it's giving me a sinusoid, zero phase delay. Um, doesn't have any phase. Now uh, it's 340 volts peak. So it's almost like what you'd get from your outlet eh, from Umeme, single phase Umeme into the house. And it's running at 50 Hertz. Then this is my SCR. It's connected to a resistor. The resistor is just five ohms. And so one side is grounded and then the other side is attached to the uh, positive terminal. So everywhere I have the ground, they're, they're obviously connected. So then <coughs> I need to use, so I'm using a pulse to switch on the SCR. So this current, so I'm getting a current from this. So I'm using that kind. This setup came with, uh, so, the SCR, when I got this SCR, so this stuff, like they, they had this stuff already, but you can't test it. So I'm using a pulse. So this voltage, this is really a pulse. And we're going to run it just from zero for just a hundred milliseconds. Okay, so we're doing transient analysis. Um, I, can, I guess I could show a little bit of this. So you see what's happening. So, so it's zero starting from zero to 100 milliseconds, uh, that's just a time step. And it's doing transient analysis. Okay. So let's run this. Uh, right. Okay. So one, so what we can, so oh, we need to see the source. So what's happening with our source? Um, okay, I can't pick there. So there it is. So three, and so it's a sinusoid. 340V to 340, plus minus 340V peak. It's, it's running at 50 hertz, so as you can see. So 20 milliseconds there. Then, so we can look at the load. So let's look at the voltage. Ah, right there. 
So you see how this differs from, sorry about the noise in the background. Um, so you see how this div differs from a diode that with a diode, you'd have the entire half cycle, the entire positive half cycle. But with a thyristor, it will not switch on until I give it a pulse. So this pulse is appearing at that point, um, 0 0.94 milliseconds, about 0 0.94 milliseconds, it switches on. So switch it on there, then it will run, then it will switch off, and then it will not switch on again until you give it a pulse. So sometimes I, there's a time I use a trick where I just give it one pulse, but people just kept redrawing this. Eh? but it means you have to keep pulsing it. So if you don't give it a pulse, it will not start. So we can look at the current. Okay, it's not a good pulse, but okay. So that's sort of the pulse I'm getting. Uh, there it is. So it switches. So I give it a pulse for a certain amount of time. Okay, so, but the, the fun stuff, the fun stuff is really, that voltage, so, so it switches on only when you when it gets a pulse, and then once it falls below that current, it will switch off. Okay, um, so um, it's got a library. I don't remember where I got this library from, <coughs> and so this library is just to create the thyristor model. So make sure that, I mean, you can get this play around with some of these numbers, a pulsing, and see how it varies. Uh, so this is an SCR, half-wave rectification, but as you can see, it can block a positive voltage until I give it a certain trigger, then it will start to conduct. So as a student, when you're working into an exam, I expect you to be able to tell me what is happening. So to be able to show me what happens with the SCR, when is it on, when is it off, those kinds of things. So you need to be able to draw all these plots. And again, you need to be able to name them. As you can see, I mean, if, if you don't label things, imagine if this person who created this program didn't bother with labeling. Eh? That would really be bad if they didn't bother to label. So you have to label, even the zero, the, the units, those kinds of things have to be shown. If you don't show it, you don't get the points. So you label that, you label, so half period, where you, I have the entire period, those kinds of things. You don't do it, you lose points. It's that simple. Okay, so I'll see you next week. Uh, hopefully that car will be, the other car would be okay next week. So we can have a physical meeting. Okay, so um, we're out of time. So we can end there. Uh, and then I'll see you next week. So we can go to the next class. I don't know what the next class is. But okay. Our recordings, doctor. It's recording. Yeah, then I need to get it to you at some point. Okay.